May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now maybe it's just me, but it feels like the news has been especially bad this week. Concerns about COVID continue to rise again. We're sort of in the middle of a hurricane right now in the Northeast that will strike other places um, more fearfully than us, thank God. You probably have been watching the news about our country's attempt to end the war in Afghanistan that's caused much hardship and suffering for its citizens. And finally, and what has affected me the most as I've watched the news, is the earthquake in Haiti that happened a week ago yesterday, killing over 2,000 people, probably more, and injuring more than 12,000. Devastation in a country that is already plagued with issues that make rescue and recovery extremely difficult. Why focus on such negativity, you might ask? We come to church for spiritual sustenance, not gloom and doom and despair. So please bear with me for a few minutes, and you will see how I believe that we in the U.S. have much to learn about spiritual sustenance from our brothers and sisters in countries that do struggle in different and often more profound ways than us. This week's earthquake in Haiti brought up memories of the even more devastating quake of 2010. As someone who had been involved in mission in Haiti for a few years, I remember the exact moment when I found out about this earthquake. I was sitting at my dining room table with my friend, Rospina Ambros. He's a Haitian Episcopal priest in our diocese. He lives in Vatican. Reverend Ambrose and I had served together while I did my seminary year at the Church of the Holy Spirit in Manapan. I asked him if he would be willing to give me lessons in Haitian Creole. Two others were also present at the table, a parishioner from St. Paul's Dedham and one from Christ Church Needham, both who are also very heavily involved with mission in Haiti and their church partnerships. They also desired to learn to speak Creole. About seven o'clock in the evening, Reverend Ambrose received a phone call from his wife in the middle of our lessons. His face did not change expression. He merely said, we need to turn on the TV. We headed into my family room and switched on CNN. You all probably remember the scenes from the news at that time, very similar to the ones we've seen this past week. Stunned people in the streets wondering if their loved ones were dead or alive Hospitals quickly overwhelmed with so many injured that they just couldn't handle them all. Family members of lost ones crying out as they dealt with the terrible shock, the sudden loss of their spouse or their parent or their sibling or child or friend. The suffering was palpable then as it is today when we watch these images happening again. So I thought it was strange when my Haitian friend, Reverend Ambrose, said, okay, turn off the TV now, back to the lesson. Are you kidding me? Back to the lesson? How could we concentrate when this enormous thing had just happened? How could he concentrate when he actually had relatives in Port-au-Prince, which was badly affected by the earthquake? Looking back, I realized that Reverend Ambrose, a man of deep, deep faith, was putting on the armor of God. In our first lesson this morning, Paul talks about this armor of God in his letter to the early Christians in the community of Ephesus, a minority within a community who knew much about suffering and persecution from their choice to believe in and follow Christ. Paul, as always, encouraged this community to be strong in the power of the Lord how do we do this? How do we do this in this day and age? Put on the armor of God, Paul counsels. This is how we cope with suffering and also our day-to-day -day life. This is how we maintain our faith in the most difficult of circumstances so that we can live with hope and not in fear. Now the image of armor conjures up fighting in war 
And indeed, unfortunately, this passage in Paul's letter to the Ephesians has been misconstrued and used to justify Christians physically putting on armor and fighting those who don't believe in the same things that they do. This, of course, was not at all what Paul meant when he used the armor analogy. But Paul was talking about symbolic fighting, if you will, fighting against spiritual darkness, not physical battles. Paul names each piece of armor that symbolizes the ways that we can find strength to cope when we are overwhelmed with life, not only in the past, as I said, but today, in our present times. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, he says. It's vital to always start with God's truth in the circumstances of our lives, especially the ones that do cause us suffering. What does God want for us, we must ask? What is God saying to us? What is the truth? Put on the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, always focus on what is right and what is true in God's eyes, not in the ways of the world. Being aware of our own weaknesses and our own sin is really important so that we can then deal with them and not let them get in the way of God's plan for us. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace, says Paul. For shoes, as a metaphor, provide us with grounding and steadfastness that can lead to peace in the middle of turmoil. Seek to be grounded in God, who will give us that peace when we most need it. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. We need help in protecting ourselves during times of difficulty. Whether we're suffering from physical or emotional illness, or coping with a loved one's illness or death, or whether we've experienced trauma, facing difficult financial issues, whatever it is, trusting in God is the protection that we need in order to see our way through. It is God who's our shield, who has our backs, no matter what we're experiencing. And finally, well not finally, second to last, take the helmet of salvation. A helmet, obviously, is crucial in protecting our heads in time of battle, or when we're playing sports, or on our bikes, or our skateboards. A spiritual helmet of salvation is needed to protect us again from our own thoughts, our own sin when we go away from God. We need to remember that we need Jesus in order to be saved. We need that salvation. We can't control a lot that's happening in the world including some of our own weaknesses at the time. So we need to rely heavily on Jesus for this. And now finally, God says, Paul says, we need the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. We come to church in search of the Word of God. We turn to prayer at different times in our day and seek His guidance. We try to take in the words that we hear and read to sustain us in all aspects of our life. So what does this have to do with Haiti? One of the many beautiful things about other cultures is, of course, learning from them. I can say with certainty that most of the people that I've encountered in Haiti are deeply spiritual and have a tremendous faith in God even during earthquakes, even when their president has been assassinated, as theirs was a few short weeks ago. I mean, I've learned from my friends like Reverend Ambrose and others not to lose heart when I or my loved ones are struggling. Sometimes when people have less in terms of material things, they focus more on the spiritual. They have more time for devoted prayer time. They live in community more closely than we do sometimes, and they make sure they reach out to others and make sure everybody around them is being taken care of, not just them in their own homes. Paul reminds us that in our faith in Christ, 
we too will be given the power and the armor that we need to survive. We'll be given truth instead of lies, peace instead of turmoil, faith instead of fear, salvation instead of sin, and the word of God instead of the word of the ways of the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.